Good morning. <clears throat> How are we doing? Good. Hey, my name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here, and we are just so glad that you are here at Fellowship with us on this second Sunday uh, in Advent. Um, every Sunday during Advent, uh, we follow the traditional liturgical church calendar, and so we celebrate the four weeks of Advent, the four Sundays of Advent, including on Christmas Eve, uh, Advent as well, and lighting of the Christ candle. And so we've been having various elders in our church and their families come and lead us in our Advent moment. And this morning, we have Dave DeBoer and uh, his family who are going to lead us in lighting the Advent candle today. This morning on the second Sunday of Advent, we're going to relight the preparation candle, which our faithful sidekick Sam is doing now. And then we will be lighting the peace candle as well. This candle signifies the peace that Christ brings to our hearts and lives. Purple again symbolizes the repentance and preparation for the Lord's coming. Isaiah 40, 3 through 5 says, A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What a neat picture of the mountains becoming valleys and the peace that the Lord gives being complete, and even creation will react to that. And mm. As we think on these things and look forward to the celebration of his coming, let's pray together. Father, as we light this candle of peace, we ask that you prepare our hearts for your coming. Clear the paths in our lives that keep us from you and make room for our, in our hearts for your peace and presence. May we welcome you with open hearts and lives prepared for your glory. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. <clears throat> Well, this past week uh, was a big week in the social media world. For those of you who are online music listeners, how many of you utilize the uh, app Spotify? You know what I mean, right? And so you know what this week was, right? It was wrapped week. That's right. And so if you're, if you're not familiar uh, with Spotify, just know this, it's, it's the way we listen to music these days. Uh, we no longer listen to records or cassettes or uh, discs or anything like that. Uh, we listen to music online, and uh, Spotify allows us to do that and to stream it. And what Wrapped is, um, it's their way uh, of just kind of showing you at the end of the year um, all the music that you've listened to, and it, it kind of looks at all of your data. It's like Big Brother. It's watching you. And it's looked at all of your data, uh, and then it, and it puts in a pretty cool form, uh, just kind of like for social media for you to post out there on Facebook or Instagram and all that kind of stuff. Uh, like what your top five artists were and what the top songs were that you listened to or podcasts. If you're not into music, some of you are into podcasts. It lists your top podcasts, all the things you listen to and how long you've listened to it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and so anyway, rap came out uh, this week, and it got me thinking about other top lists. Like, we as a society, as a culture, we like these top lists, like the top, uh, you know, 25 of that and the top, you know, 10 of that. Uh, and, and, and so I kind of went down just a little rabbit trail this week, uh, down the top list of stuff, and I came across the top 10 Christmas movie cliches. And well, I just had to click on that link because it is Christmas movie season. And so uh, these are common themes or similar themes that we see repeated in Christmas movies. And so does anyone have a guess, at least according to this particular list that I was looking at, um, anyone have a guess as to what the top, the number one Christmas movie cliche trope uh, might be? Like, just like last week, I heard like a bunch of, yep, uh, and, and so um, you're speaking in tongues, I'll interpret. Um, so I was just a low-hanging spiritual joke there. Um, some of you are like, what? what was that? Uh, so, so according to this list, the number one Christmas movie cliche 
uh, is dysfunctional families. It's dysfunctional families. So if you start thinking about it, like some of our favorite movies that like uh, Home Alone, you know, dysfunctional family, Elf, uh, dysfunctional family, A Christmas Story, dysfunctional family, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, dysfunctional family. Like we see it over and over and over again. Let me give you just a few others because I know you're curious. Uh, some of the other tropes or cliches were um, saving Christmas from some kind of peril. Right, so Christmas is in danger, uh, and somebody swoops in to save the day uh, for Christmas. Uh, another one was kids teach adults to believe in Santa. Right, so uh, adults have, have grown up, and they've forgotten to believe in Santa, and some kid comes along and restores faith uh, in Santa Claus. And, and then for you Hallmark Christmas movie fans, no need to raise your hand. Uh, city girl heads to a small town for the holidays... <laughs> Wait, I didn't, you didn't let me finish. <laughs> City girl heads to a small town for the holidays and finds a second chance at love, right? That's what the Hallmark movies are about and so on. So listen, I think the reason that dysfunctional families is number one on the list is to a certain degree we can all relate to it. Um, it's the story of the dysfunctional family who over time, throughout the course of the movie, becomes the functional family. And, and, and that's why this hits us so hard, because we can probably all relate. In fact, for some of us, we don't really even look forward um, to the holidays because our family is so dysfunctional. And so everything between you know, Christmas and, and New Year's is, uh, is hard because uh, you know, the holidays are hard when the family dynamics are difficult. So we're in this series right now where we're looking at various names that Jesus has given in the Christmas narrative. Last week, we talked about uh, Jesus was given the, the title, uh, Son of the Most High. Uh, today, we land on probably the most famous name. In fact, you could call it the number one Christmas uh, name of Jesus cliche, and that is the name Emmanuel. Uh, that word Emmanuel is precisely what we need at Christmas because it is the thing that makes dysfunctional functional. But the path to functionality actually goes through, as we'll see in this story, some very, very difficult circumstances. So if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Uh, this is probably the smallest passage. I think it's just eight verses or so that we're going to take a look at. And so we're just going to kind of roll through this one verse or a couple of verses at a time. So let's begin in verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 says, The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's just pause right there. Now, when you and I read this um, with 21st century ears, this part of the Christmas story has a, a, a little whiff of mythology to it, doesn't it? But because even those of us who would say that we believe in Jesus, we sometimes struggle with the supernatural stuff in the Bible, like we read about here, this virgin birth. But here's the thing, if you're not down with miracles, the reality is, is you're really not down with Christianity because the whole thing is miracles. I mean, we just see miracle after miracle. I mean, think about this. We believe in Jesus, right? And we believe that Jesus was the son of God, that he actually is God and that he has existed before there was any creation, I mean, just believing that is a miracle. And we believe that Jesus, uh, wherever he was with the Father, if that's heaven, that's kind of the only label that we have for it, wherever they were, that Jesus stepped out of that and he stepped into his creation. Um, uh, that he was born of a virgin, that's a miracle. He lived a perfect life, that's a miracle. 
He, he died on the cross, and his life paid the penalty uh, for our sins that we couldn't pay. That's a miracle. He was buried, uh, and then he rose himself from the dead. That's a miracle. And then the Scripture says when we believe in him, that he gives us the Holy Spirit. So in essence, we have the Spirit of the Father. Jesus gives us the Spirit. The Spirit takes up residence inside of us. That's a miracle. Like the whole thing is miraculous. And so this legitimate miracle of the virgin birth that we read about here of Jesus becomes the source of some legitimate pain for Mary and Joseph. Last week, if you were here, um, we kind of looked at the Christmas narrative a little bit from Mary's side of the story. This angel comes to Mary, and, and so this week we're going to take a look at the Christmas narrative a little bit more from Joseph's side of things. And this is actually a little bit difficult to do. I, I don't know if you know this. Um, the reason this is difficult to do is because not much is said about Joseph in Scripture at all. Uh, this is not the Joseph of the Old Testament. I'm talking about Joseph who was betrothed uh, to Mary, Jesus' stepfather, right? There is just not a lot written about him here. In fact, this passage that we're looking at here in Matthew is really most of what we learn about him. There's little bits in other places, but none of the gospel accounts actually record a word that Joseph ever said or spoke. And so what do we know about him? Well, look at verse 19. Here's what it says. It's talking about Mary and says, So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. Okay, so, so we don't know much about him other than what this story gives us. And, and beyond what we read here, what evidence do we have that Joseph was any kind of righteous man? Right? Other than being told here that he was. Okay, well, we'll think about this for a second. Try to put yourself in Joseph's shoes, okay? I'm really not trying to, to, to be risque here, but we can assume for a moment, we probably um, can assume this, that Joseph knew how babies were made, and he knew, he was 100% certain that he had not participated in the baby-making process with Mary. Now, Again, you may find miracles hard to believe, but you could take comfort in knowing that Joseph struggled with this too. He didn't believe this either. Um, it's right here in the text because what it says is, is he heard about this presumably from Mary and he decides, yeah, you know, no matter what's going on here, uh, I don't think I want any part of this. But because there's, likely a couple of options here. Um, number one is, well, Mary's just concocted this lie. Like, she's a lunatic. Like, she's crazy. She's off a rocker. And she so desperately wants to be with me that she has made up this story that she's pregnant so that, that, that maybe she's just trying to force me to get to the altar, okay? And that's one way to look at it. Um, the other is, She's been sleeping around. I mean, she really is pregnant. And I wasn't involved in this, but somebody else had to have been. And so either one, I think he's thinking to himself, she, she's not really wife material. Right? I mean, he's, he logically concludes that he doesn't want to be a part of this. And so you're like, well, how is he righteous and all that? Well, as a good man, it says here he didn't want to shame her. He didn't want to shame her more than she was already going to be shamed. I mean, the evidence of, of Joseph's righteousness is how he, he handles Mary with such tenderness. I mean, he must have been angry, right? I mean, just think about this. For, he, had to, he had to be angry. He must have been livid about this situation. At least he was confused. But what we read here is he decides to divorce her quietly instead of publicly shaming her. And then here's what it says in verse 20. It says, But after he'd considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. 
because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Okay, so after Joseph weighs his options, right, it says he considered things, he goes to bed. J- just like what had happened with Mary, an angel appears to, uh, to Joseph. This time it appears to Joseph in his dreams and, and confirms that Mary's story is in fact true. That yes, she's a virgin, that yes, she's pregnant, like this is legit. Th- this is really happening. Okay, so let me just stop right there. This is not an optional theological position. This is essential to Christianity. And the key is right here in verse 21. It says, she will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save people from their sins. And you're like, well, how does that tell us how important theology is, okay? Well, um, we hear this verse a lot, especially around Christmas time, but the richness of this moment is lost on most of us unless we understand the culture. This angel appears to Joseph just as the angel said to Mary, right? This child will be named Jesus. So we talked about that last week. The angel Gabriel shows up to Mary and says, hey, you're going to have a son uh, and you're to name him Jesus. Uh, Presumably, Gabriel, same angel, shows up uh, in a dream and tells Joseph the very same thing. You're going to name him Jesus. And you're like, well, what's the big deal with that? So what? Okay, well, think about this. The angel is saying to Joseph, you don't get to name your child. He's saying to the patriarch of this new little family that's forming, you don't get to name the one that you're going to raise as your firstborn son. This is a huge deal. This is a huge deal in Hebrew. This is a huge deal to you. How many of you would let somebody else tell you and your wife how you're going to name your child? You wouldn't. Right, And so this is a big deal in their culture and massively significant because people didn't name their kids just because it was a popular name to name them. They didn't name their kids because it was a a unique name. They didn't uh, name their kids because they found a unique spelling, like a twist that they could make on a name. They didn't do any of those things. When they named their kids, it, it was for a couple of reasons, right? What they did is they named their kids with a particular twofold purpose. The first was to convey authority. To convey authority. Throughout the Bible, the one who gives the name is the one who has authority. So we see in Genesis, God comes to Adam. He takes his authority, he places it on Adam, and he tells Adam, You name the animals. You have the authority to name the animals. You know that, right? God didn't name the animals. He gives that authority, passes that authority on to Adam, and Adam gets to name all of the animals. We continue in the Old Testament. We see that God himself changes Abram's name to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. Right? We see that the Pharaoh uh, changed Joseph's name. Not this Joseph, not Jesus' stepfather, but the Joseph from the Old Testament. He changes his name to what, Chuck? You guessed it. Zappanath Panea, which is why we still call him Joseph. (laughs) (laughs) Nebuchadnezzar does the same thing with Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. Jesus takes Simon's name and he changes his name to the name Peter. And so naming someone is the prerogative of the one with authority. So the angel saying to Joseph, you don't have that authority. This is not your son. This is my son. I have the authority. And his heavenly father has decided to name him Jesus. The second significance of names in the Bible is that we see that often names closely match someone's calling and purpose in life, right? Their mission. 
You have to be a little bit careful with this because sometimes a name is just a name, but often uh, when the name is not just a name, uh, we're told what that name means. And in this verse, uh, it's right here. It says, you are to name him Jesus, and here's the purpose, here's the mission, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, here's what's peculiar about that. Um, some of you are probably going to hear this for the first time, so I don't want this to be confusing. But Jesus wasn't really his name. <laughs> um, we call him Jesus. That is an English word. But that is an English word that we get from a uh, German uh, adaptation of a Latin transliteration of a Greek word that was a take on a Hebrew word. <laughs> It's a true story. It jumps through about five linguistic hoops uh, to get to Jesus. Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua, that's his name. That's Jesus' real name. And so let's just break that down for a second. Yeshua, yeah, Y-E, means the Lord. For those of you who are a little bit younger, maybe under the age of 30, you're familiar with Kanye West, who wants to go by ye or ye. That's very intentional. He wants to do that because he wants to be called the Lord. That's a fact. That's why he does that. So, so that's what ye, Y-E means the Lord. Shua means what? The one who saves. So Yeshua is the Lord who saves. That's his name, because he would be the one that would save people from their sins. So check this out. The one with authority, God the Father, gives a person a name that describes their purpose. God the Father gives Jesus the name that says, he will be, my son will be the Lord who will save. In fact, this is what Jesus himself would say in John chapter 6. He would say this, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This was Jesus' calling. He was to be Yeshua, the one who saves. And so the Father names Jesus, and he sets his purpose before him. And then Jesus lives out that purpose. And so you're like, well, what does this mean for me? Well, here's what it means. Whose you are determines who you are. Whose you are determines who you are. And this is vitally important. See, if we place ourselves, if you and I, if we place ourselves at the center of everything, right? Let's just say the center of the universe, then everything will, will, will bend and lean in toward that. Everything bends and leans toward the center of the universe. Every decision that we make um, in, in our life will lean and bend toward us being the center of the universe, and who we think we are has everything to do with who we think owns us. And so if, if we are the center of the universe, then all of our pleasure, all of our contentment, all of our safety, the absence of pain, whatever it is that we're seeking, all of those things will we'll try to, we'll do things in life to try to serve that purpose because we put ourselves at the center of the universe. If another person is the center of the universe. Let's say it's a spouse that you try to put in that place or one of your children. Then all of the decisions that we make, everything that we do will bend towards them and that causes us to worship that individual. To do everything that we can do to pro provide for them, right? But the reality is this, is that you are not your own. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said it this way. He said, every faculty you have, your power of thinking or of moving your limbs from moment to moment is given to you by God. 
If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not, in a sense, his own already. In other words, whether you acknowledge it or not, you belong to God. Every breath, every heartbeat, every minute, how you spend your time, how you spend your resources, how you, every dollar belongs to him. And so what does that make us? Well, the Bible gives us a word for who we are uh, based on whose we are. And that word is this, stewards. That's, that's who you and I are. Whose we are is God's, and so that makes us something. And who are we? We are stewards. We talked about this a few weeks ago. In fact, in our James series, a steward is someone who is like a manager who has a, a certain limited uh, power of attorney or authority to manage somebody else's belongings. That's what a steward is. And so in a very real sense, everything you do in your entire life is an act of stewardship. How you treat your physical body, an act of stewardship. Um, how you show love towards your neighbor, act of stewardship. How you spend your time, how you spend your money, how you spend your energy. You are stewarding something that doesn't belong to you. That's why it should come as no surprise to us that the Bible talks uh, about money as sort of this barometer for us, right? For us just trying to figure out whose we are, this whole thing in our life, because there's almost no greater barometer for our priorities than how we steward our resources, the money that God's given us. Right? And there's a lot of times, especially after payday, when we get paid and we pull out our phone and we check our balance online and we see it's a little high before we start having to pay the man, you know, everything. And we go, oh, look at that, man, I made a lot of money. That stuff's mine. And you're right. I mean, you did something to earn it. God gave you that ability, though, to earn that. And so every penny is his. And so that's why we see this throughout Scripture. It's always like trying to, like, what are you doing with God's money? We see this message repeated over and over again. And like, if you have a budget, and I hope you do, you can see what's important to you, right? You can look at your budget. You can look at your calendar. You can look at how you spend your time, how you spend your week, your energy. And you can know who you think you are. There's a concept in the Bible that's called first fruits. I did a series on it probably seven or eight years ago, and it's basically this thought that reminds us, um, this is a biblical theme that reminds us of, of who should be our priority, right? And so we give God the first of, of everything. God should get the first fruits. He should get the first of everything, the first of our schedule, the first of our energy, the first of our time. See, when Jesus is the first of everything, he gets the first before anything else. And then the rest of our life bends towards him. We do everything that we can to make him the center of the universe. But when something else is the center, everything else is going to bend toward that. We're stewards. We don't own ourselves. And so as stewards, we are managers of everything that God has given us. Okay, let's go back and look back to Jesus. Look at this in verse 22 and verse 23. It says, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And here's what that was, verse 23. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. Okay, and so what Matthew's doing here is he's quoting the prophet Isaiah, and you'll notice that Isaiah actually gives Jesus another title, Emmanuel. And uh, what does Emmanuel mean? It means God is with us. So we're seeing in this series that Jesus has lots of names, right? And so is he Emmanuel? 
Yes, he's Emmanuel. Is he Jesus? Yes, he's Yeshua. Uh, is he uh, uh, the son of man? Yes, he's all of those things. And I love taking that name Jesus, Yeshua, and putting it with the name Emmanuel as it is in this passage. So think about this, Jesus, um, Emmanuel, it means the Lord who is with us saves. The Lord who is with us saves. I mean, there's just so much packed into that. I mean, think about this. Jesus came to save us, to be with us, to walk with us. Jesus was tempted as we are. He suffered as we do. He lived out his life under the purposes and the authority of his father. He knew who he was. He spent his whole life for others. The arc of his life was bent toward that purpose. But now for a second, here's what I want to do. I want to go back to the person that we've already forgotten about because we know so little about him, Joseph. Kind of already forgot we were talking about Joseph. So Joseph's hearing all of this for the first time. He heard it from Mary, but, but now he hears it from this angel in his dream. And that has to be absolutely jarring for him, don't you think? Because here's what he knows. He knows if he marries Mary that he's inviting shame onto himself. Again, everyone in their small community. We're going to talk more about where they were from next week. They're from this little town called Nazareth. And most scholars believe there was anywhere between 100 to 500 people. So everyone's going to know about this in the small community. They're going to know that she's pregnant before these two got married. And again, that doesn't carry as much shame. It carries some shame in our culture today, but in their culture, this is unthinkable. And so Joseph knew who he was. Look at this, verse 24. When Joseph wakes up from this dream, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and then he named him Jesus. So don't miss this. Joseph named him. He he placed himself under the authority of God, and he named him Jesus. I mean, think about what Joseph's doing in this moment, right? He is... He is giving up his right to direct his own life. Joseph ranks his stepson over himself. And he decides to take on suffering and shame. He's giving up his right to a good reputation. Again, he and Mary had what a lot of people would look at as this little dysfunctional family. In fact, as I was reflecting on Joseph this week, it struck me that he pretty much disappears from the story shortly after this. I mean, he takes his family uh, to Egypt. We read a little bit about that. We read about this instance in the Gospels where they kind of lose Jesus in the temple for a couple of days. You remember that story when Jesus is 12, but then he just disappears. And so I kind of was trying to figure that out this week. I'm like, how can we don't hear from Jesus anymore? And, and so I did just a little bit of research. And most scholars believe that, that Joseph died before Jesus grew up. I mean, we can't know this for sure. We, we just know this, that, that he wasn't around much at all. Right? And so if this is true, if he died, he probably wasn't there to see Jesus' ministry. He wasn't there to see Jesus do any miracles. He wasn't there to see, you know, uh, Jesus make more wine at, in the, at a wedding. He didn't see Jesus walk on water. He wasn't there when his son was nailed to the cross. When he was buried and get to see him raised from the dead, we know his mom was there. He didn't get to see his son become Emmanuel probably died before the end of the story. 
He believed it, but he didn't see it. I mean, can you just imagine Joseph dies and then a split second later he wakes up in glory and his stepson is the Savior. I don't know what your Christmas is going to be like. I don't know if you're the person who wakes up on Christmas morning and just cannot wait to spend it with family and you do the whole, like, you know, break out the jammies on Christmas Eve, that whole thing. I don't know if that's you or if you have such a dysfunctional family history that this is a season of pain. Or maybe for you, this is your first season, your first Christmas without a particular loved one. I don't know what your Christmas is going to be like, but this is what I know is true. If you believe in Jesus, you will have eternal life and that he will raise you up on the last day to be with him. And he's going to introduce you perhaps to his stepdad, Joe, and his mom, Mary, a righteous dude, and a poor lady who grew up to see their son go to the cross. And that's what this Christmas season is all about. He's Yeshua, Emmanuel, the Lord who is with us, saves. Amen? Amen. We've come to the time in our service where we want to respond to whatever the Holy Spirit uh, might be doing in our hearts and our lives and our spirits this morning. And, and so we want to give you some space to do just that. The worship team is going to make their way back to the platform at this time. And um, this is a time in our service where um, we give back to the Lord. If you're here today and you want to support our church financially, you came prepared to Uh, give an offering or give your tithe, you can do that at this time if you haven't already done it. We do that here at FBC through what we call faith boxes. You'll see those in the back of the room. Uh, There's giving envelopes attached to either side of that faith box, and you'll see each one of those at the exit doors, and so you can do that during this time. If you're here this morning, and uh, man, the Lord just laid something on your heart, and and you want to pray with someone, we'll hear in just a moment folks from our prayer team. Some of our elders will be down here. Some of our staff will be down here. You could come and pray with them. If you're here this morning and you just want to pray um, by yourself, you just want to come and kneel at the altar, feel free to do that as well. Uh, And then um, if you would just sing uh, while people are coming to pray or having their time with the Lord, we respond uh, through singing together. And so as we prepare uh, to do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the truth that all who believe in him um, will have eternal life and they will be raised up on the last day. And so we confess that we um, believe in you this morning, uh, maybe for some of us uh, in this room. We're confessing that for the first time. Maybe this is the first time we've ever considered some of the things that we've heard about this morning. I pray that today would be the day that some people uh, in this room would believe in Jesus, in Yeshua, in Emmanuel, the God who came to save us so that they may experience eternal life and be raised up with him on the last day. We pray this in Jesus' precious name.